Hi, Jenkins. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, so if you can, if you're standing, go ahead and fill in every available seat. Uh, if you can, and if not, there's standing room in the back. Uh, welcome to today's PE 450 course lecture and professional development opportunity. Thank you for joining us live on our YouTube channel, West Point. Uh, we hope you enjoy today's topic brought to you by Major Christina Fowler Martin. Um, Major Christina Fowler Martin is a 65 Charlie dietitian with a certification in sports dietetics and strength and conditioning. She has held various clinical and performance dietitian roles. Her recent assignments include the West Point Athletic Sports Nutrition Fellowship and the H2F pilot and official brigade role out at Fort Drum. She is currently a DP instructor at USMA and teaches military movement and nutrition for performance within the kinesiology major. Before we get started, uh, I want to take this opportunity to address a little bit of an administrative point for our PE 450 cadets here with us live. Make sure you sign into the Mentimeter and select your instructor. There were two additional options added just moments ago, as you saw. So please make sure you do that. That will ensure that you receive credit for this course. So I'll give you about 30 seconds to do that uh, or have a friend do it on your behalf uh, if you don't have your phone on you. And then once you do that, please silence your cell phone and make sure you put it away. All right, anybody need that QR code any further? All right, there is an opportunity to provide some feedback. So if you're on your men's meter on your phone at the end, you can log back in, give us some feedback so that we know where your interests lie and we can continue to make these course lectures interesting and exciting for rounds to come throughout this academic year. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome Major Christina Fowler Martin. All right, thank you all. I'm really excited to be here with y'all today to talk about nutrition readiness, but with a real emphasis on what you need to know as a junior leader, okay? So if you thought that this brief was gonna be me, telling you exactly what you need to eat to have the perfect diet, this is sadly not going to be that lecture, okay? If you do want more information about that, you know that USCC has an awesome dietitian, Miss Christine Giordamo, and she'd be happy to meet with you individually to go over any of that stuff, okay? So today we're going to keep it broad. We're going to keep it about resources that you will have at your disposal at your units, and then also just kind of things that you need to think about as a leader. So here's our agenda. Again, not going over anything in super, super detail to include the last thing about dietary supplements. I know y'all had a lot of questions about dietary supplements. So you will get a copy of the slides. There's some additional information that will be on there for you to review, but I will go through that a little bit more briefly today. All right, so let's just start with adequate fueling. All right, and I know this seems like maybe sort of a common sense thing, uh, however, it doesn't usually, it's not quite that easy, right? Sometimes it's hard to get the amount of energy that you need to support yourself throughout the day. And if you could imagine, it's also, there's some challenges for your soldiers to be able to do the same. All right, so there's so much nutrition information out there. There's so many different things that are marketed to us on a daily basis of like, this is going to be the thing that's going to make or break your health or make or break your performance. All right, but we've really got to kind of just bring it back a little bit and think about what are the things that actually do make a big difference and what are some of those things that really don't make a huge difference overall. So this is what I like to call the hierarchy of fueling needs. All right, so the first thing that we need to work on is the very bottom, the base of this pyramid here, the base of the hierarchy, and that's getting enough. All right, so getting enough calories coming in on a regular basis is the first thing that we have to do when we're looking at both health and performance or optimizing both of those, 
okay? Once we have the calories coming in that we need, so the energy that our body requires for all of the work that we're asking our body to do on a daily basis, then we can start building on that. We can think about variety. What, what's going on with our macronutrients? Am I getting enough of each individual one? You know, we can have enough calories, but if overall maybe we're lower on carbohydrates, lower on protein, we still might not be meeting our goals. All right. Within that, we want to think about variety amongst those groups because carbohydrates, fat, protein, that's just an overarching kind of classification of the food. But within those things, there's so many different foods that fit. And so if the only kind of carbohydrate you ever eat is rice, even if it's brown rice, we're still probably lacking some nutrients. So we want to have a nice variety of lots of different types of foods that fall within those categories. Okay, so once we've got that in check, then we want to think about timing, all right? And this really, you know, from a performance perspective, and as active individuals yourself, you've probably already played around with sort of what makes sense for you to eat before a training session. And maybe you've had some mistakes along the way, as many of us have, of, you know, eating the wrong thing before we train or before competition, and we immediately regret that life decision. So um, we want to think about the timing and what's going to make sense for that activity that we're doing. Now, this is up a little bit higher because ultimately, if we don't have enough energy coming in, just because I have a well-timed snack before training, it's probably not going to do that much for my performance as working this bottom part of the hierarchy here. Okay. And so once we've got those things in place, then we can think about some specifics. So this is where dietary supplements usually come into play, okay? Maybe you want to supplement with some type of protein powder, add in a vitamin and mineral that you might be deficient in, okay? Again, that is at the top, and it doesn't make that much of a difference overall if we aren't meeting the rest of the things on this hierarchy, okay? So when it comes to, you know, where do I want to spend my energy when it comes to nutrition, we want to think about it like this, that we really got to focus on that bottom stuff. And same with your soldiers, right? They're going to be like, hey, I want to know what supplements you take. Well, let's back it up because you could maybe take the same supplements that I take. But if you're overall not eating enough, then we're probably not going to see those um, adaptations that we're looking for with our training. Okay. So this is kind of just the overall thing here. But with that emphasis being that we want to eat enough. And I truly cannot say that enough. Um, I know that we sort of culturally live in a world where oftentimes we're being told that we are not or that we are eating too much, but for active individuals, that messaging doesn't seem to be super helpful, and we want to think about fueling all that activity that we're asking our body to do. So that brings me to our next little thing we're going to talk about here, which is energy availability. All right, many of y'all are probably familiar with the, I guess, phrasing of calories in, calories out, or caloric balance, okay? So it, that insinuates that there's this sort of balance that needs to happen between the energy that we expend and the energy that we take in, okay? And oftentimes that's tied to the um, maintenance or changes of our weight. However, there's an additional concept that we know a lot more about now um, that is called energy availability. Okay, so this is ultimately the energy that's available for our body's just general like systems that have to function after we take away what's needed for performance. Okay, so ideally we have enough energy coming in that's going to support both our body, body systems working at max capacity, max ability, and then also the performance or the activity that we're asking our body to do. That's ideal, right? However, sometimes that doesn't happen. Maybe intentionally it doesn't happen. Like we are trying to decrease our the amount of calories we're taking in or we're increasing the amount of activity that we're doing, maybe as a way to change that caloric balance, change our weight. Um, or we maybe have a increase in our training load. All right, so we're not doing anything intentional, but our training load changes and we don't change our eating to um, go along with that. Okay, so when we have that mismatch, it would make sense that our body would be like, oh, got to protect those, those 
you know, systems that have to function on a day to day. However, it does kind of the opposite. It actually prioritizes performance. So energy availability and specifically low energy availability, which is depicted here in both of these sides here. So not enough energy coming in, or maybe we've got too much training load. And again, not enough calories to support that. That is termed low energy availability. And so that just is trying to describe that there's a bit of a partitioning of calories in terms of you know, what they're used for. So the partitioning happens with the calories needed for activity and that leaves the body systems to have to make do with less. All right, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what that might look like here. So stay with me, don't get too distracted. This is a really pretty colorful slide here. All right, but when we are in that low energy availability state for a prolonged period of time, or we are just in such a deficit that's very severe, that's gonna impact our body systems, okay? So if they're having to do more or the same amount with less energy coming in, there's some things that it can do to help, you know, essentially our body's kind of got one main goal to keep going. So there are some things that it can do to support that. All right. So let's just take digestion, for example. So if we don't have enough energy coming in to support all of the things that have to happen, all the energy that's needed to essentially digest, absorb our food, get it to us so that we can use it for energy. Well, we can slow that process down because it actually does take a lot of energy to be able to move food through our digestive tract. So we can slow that down a little bit. And then all of a sudden, now we're experiencing some changes in our um, digestive system. So maybe we're feeling constipated more often or et cetera. So that's just one example. But if you look here on the slide, all right, that the, the sequence of having all of those different systems impacted, so the signs and symptoms that come along with that, when someone is in that prolonged state of energy availability, that is what's now termed REDS, or relative energy deficiency in sport. All right, and perhaps in you know, your research and kind of just looking at things online, you may be familiar with the female athlete triad, which was just this... Um, collection of symptoms experienced by women who were um, not eating enough, so low energy availability, not having enough energy coming in. They were experiencing issues with their bones, and also they did not have a menstrual cycle, so amenorrhea. So those three things together found that, okay, these people are experiencing a lot of health um, effects and performance effects as well. So that has now turned into what we now know as relative energy deficiency in sport. And, you know, a couple important things happen. The first one is that it expanded to basically all of our systems because really all of them are impacted by not having enough energy to do the things that we need to do. And then secondly, it expanded it to include males because um, certainly both men and women are impacted by not having enough calories coming in and it still can impact our systems in, in very similar ways. So if you'll notice on this slide, you have on the left, the impacts to health. And so that really in incorporates all of our body systems. And then we have the impacts to performance. So you can just kind of look through some of that. We've got changes in cognition, decreased motivation, changes in muscle strength, endurance, so a lot of stuff that we don't really want to happen, especially when individuals are training really hard. You know, the, the thought is that, you know, I'm going to train really hard. I'm spending a lot of time on this. I want to make sure that I get those adaptations. But this can certainly get in the way of that. And, you know, from an injury standpoint, if we have that prolonged period of time, then it certainly can make you be at greater risk of having some type of musculoskeletal injury, which is already a concern in the Army as is. So eating enough is one of those ways that we can work towards kind of pretend, preventing or at least protecting ourselves from having that happen to us. All right, so when we think about, well, okay, so I, I need to eat enough, but like what really is that gonna look like, okay? I've got a couple pictures here to show you. These are essentially just based off of the USDA's MyPlate, but certainly with a little bit more of a performance um, 
kind of spin on it, but we've got our easy training plate. So when we look at these plates, it's just broken down to kind of the level of activity that you're gonna be doing. So we got easy, moderate, hard training days. All right, and that can help you make sure that you are getting enough of that energy, enough of those macronutrients to support that activity, just based on kind of what your training load looks like. So with the first one here, if you think about just having half your plate there for your fruits and vegetables or some type of colorful item, then we've got about a quarter for carbohydrates, a quarter for protein, and then there's some certainly some additional stuff on the outside. Okay, so this is kind of the basic plate. I would really say I almost don't put this on my slides because this is not y'all, okay? Most of y'all are not going to need this easy training plate, okay? So let's just skip right to the moderate training plate because that's really where most of y'all are probably going to start here. Okay, so if you look at that, what changed? Carbs, really, that's, that's the main thing that is impacted here. So when our training intensity increases, then we are gonna need more, more carbohydrates to support that activity. So we've got a, our plate kind of divided into thirds, I'll say. I like to think of it like a peace sign. So we've got a third for carbs, a third for your proteins, and a third for vegetables. Again, looking at both these plates, right, we're getting some good variety. All right, we're not eating the same thing every day. All right, sometimes that might happen just, you know, based on what's going on around you. And that's okay. Like our body's pretty flexible, it can handle that. But overall, if we have the options, we wanna be looking for some variety and balance. All right, and then lastly here, we've got our heavy training plate, or, you know, this might be what you would have before competition, before a longer competition. So again, what changed? Carbs, Carbs. yes, okay. So that becomes the, pri the priority here. The emphasis becomes carbohydrates. So we're looking at half the plate now is carbohydrates with smaller amounts for fruits and vegetables and protein really kind of remains the same about for each of the plates here. But ultimately the emphasis is less on those fruits and vegetables because even though fruits and vegetables are great, they give us vitamins and minerals, all those nutrients we need, they don't have a lot of calories a lot of the time and they don't have a lot of carbohydrates per weight. So that is why we are gonna prioritize those carbohydrates to support that activity that we are doing, okay? So these plates come from a really awesome website, which perhaps you're already familiar with it, the Human Performance Resource Center. All right, this is a DOD created website or DOD partnership created website that's got a lot of great information that I will reference here in my presentation. Okay, so if you're thinking about, okay, well, how am I going to talk to my soldiers about what, you know, potentially their plates could look like to optimize performance? These are easily things that you could show them. All right. And then how do you know if you're eating enough? What a question. Okay. Well, you could track it. Okay. That doesn't always work for everybody. It's not always super practical. So I like to think about some of the more subjective things that I can internally assess about myself to kind of see if I'm on the right track there. So you'll just see kind of some different things here. Obviously, we can look at our energy levels. What is our performance looking like? How are our training sessions going? Like, am I arriving to training feeling ready to train? Do I feel like I'm still recovering from the last workout? Am I having some lingering issues that don't seem to be getting better? Am I thinking about food a lot? That one seems kind of like, okay. But really when we aren't eating enough, oftentimes our thoughts about food increase and they can be a little bit more intense. Oftentimes when we are well fed, when it's time to eat or we start getting some signals that we are feeling hungry, then you know we start thinking about food. Um, you know what, that sounds good. I would really like to have that for lunch today. But then once we are fed, those thoughts kind of go away. But if we're thinking a lot about food, especially if you're thinking about foods that maybe you feel like might be off limits for you, um, that sometimes is a sign that like, oh, okay, maybe we just aren't eating enough overall. Okay, and then lastly, digestion, I already mentioned that a little bit, just, you know, if, if we are not having enough energy to support our gastrointestinal tract working, then that can certainly slow things down there. And then finally, mood, you know, is my mood feeling stable throughout the day? Um, if I notice that, wow, you know, I really, at about three o'clock every day, I really seem to be pretty rude to the people around me and have a really short temper. That could be a sign that maybe we need a well-placed snack or just overall more energy coming in. All right, so just to touch briefly on injury, because certainly that is something that you will see within your formations. Um, 
Many units handle injury a little bit differently, but now that we are moving to most units, or at least most BCTs, having a holistic health and fitness performance team present, um, injuries are, are handled by you know, the professionals who know a lot about how to manage and rehab injuries. But ultimately, you may have folks that are participating in some kind of like rehabilitative PT program. Ultimately, we still need to eat enough. All right, we are having a increased need just because there may be wounds that need to heal, but then also, you know, that needs to be balanced with the fact that maybe we're not training as much as we were before. All right, but it certainly doesn't mean that now is a time where we're going to greatly, you know, cut our calories because that certainly could impact our recovery from that injury. All right, we've got some psychological stuff going on. I think especially in our, you know, environment with the body composition standards, there's a lot of concern about, okay, well, what's going to happen to my body composition if I don't train the same way that I was training before? And so that's certainly something that your soldiers could come to you of like, you know, I'm kind of worried about stopping doing this because I, you know, I'm worried that now it's going to make my body composition or body fat exceed the minimum or the maximum standard. And then also eating is a coping mechanism. It just is. It's comforting to eat for most of us. And that's okay. It's, it's fine that it is a coping mechanism, but it can't be our only coping mechanism. So we've got to have other tools in the toolbox to help get us through stressful times so that we're not leaning so heavily on that one tool. Okay. And then we want to think about maintaining muscle mass as best we can during times of, you know, either immobility or um, just recovering from that injury. So prioritizing protein, specifically leucine, which is one of the branch chain amino acids. Leucine is found in um, higher amounts in like dairy products, specifically the ones from cows. So milk, cottage cheese, but it also is in beans as well. So um, making sure that we get a good source of leucine and then consuming that protein throughout the day versus just kind of like one or two larger meals. Um, evidence really shows us that with that protein spread out throughout the day, there's a better stimulation for our muscle growth. Um, and then lastly, supplements are something that they, um, that could be helpful too, but that again is something pretty individualized. So I would say get with your unit dietitian to be able to work through some of that. And then lastly, alcohol intake. Certainly not going to be helpful for recovering from an injury and could make it more likely that the person re-injures themselves. So if we can decrease alcohol intake when someone's recovering from an injury, that is always going to be helpful. All right. I want to talk about food insecurity as well. And this is something that actually a lot of y'all had questions about. So, you know, certainly... The pandemic really brought this to light of, you know, what a concern this is for the military population. Um, I think a lot of the times people might think that because a lot of that stuff is sort of provided to us that everyone should be okay, but it doesn't seem like that's the case. So we've got about 24% of active duty service members and their families are food insecure. And the majority of them, unfortunately, are junior enlisted soldiers. And so there are a lot of resources being brought about in, um, because of what we're discovering here. Some of them are listed here. SNAP is the Supplemental <laughs> Nutrition Assistance Program. And so that is a program where you qualify based off of your income. One kind of interesting thing, though, about that application is that your BAH counts towards your total income. And so that sometimes can make it difficult for people to meet that income threshold because that kind of is inflating their income a little bit. In addition to that, and that's, that's for really any family that meets that threshold, okay? When we have um, WIC, which is women, infants, and children, this is just for, you know, individuals that have a family with children or pregnant mothers, pregnant or nursing mothers. And that one is also has an income um, threshold that must be met as well as, you know, there has to, they have to show a nutritional need. So, you know, whatever the case, the, the WIC folks can assess, like, do they have, does the family have the ability to, to 
be able to buy everything that's needed for that um, child. And so if that's not the case, then there's additional um, money or usually it's like a voucher that's given to them that they can use at the grocery store. So those are two options that are available. And then the next one, the FS, FSSA, I forget what it stands for. I can look at it real quick here. Oh, I don't have my notes up. But either way, this is something that actually is only available to folks when they're deployed. So if your soldier deploys, their family back home can receive this particular assistance. Um, so something to think about, especially if y'all are getting ready for a deployment. And then finally, Military One Source. You probably heard about it for other things related to the military. It truly does have so many resources, but it has an entire page dedicated to all of the different resources that are available. So um, I have the link at the end of this presentation where you could easily just click on it and get everything that you need to know. OK, but that definitely is a concern that, you know, if if folks are having to forego being able to adequately fuel themselves, then as a, you know, as a leader, that's a readiness issue, okay? If the rest of the family is going without to make sure that the children are getting enough to eat, then that becomes a readiness issue for you if those folks are showing up to your formation, showing up to PT that morning and haven't eaten anything since like lunch the day before, okay? So we wanna make sure that we can address that and you know, you just gotta ask those questions. You know, Of course, when you're getting to know your soldiers, it, this can be a hard thing for them to talk about within the um, military kind of treatment facility system. Currently, they've started to implement a, it's called the hunger, hunger index. It's supposed to be like a vital sign, like, you know, we're taking your blood pressure. It's just two questions that are asked, you know, do you, are there times where you feel like you are not going to be able to buy food if you run out of it? It's, just two questions that they ask. So that's another way where people are going to be referred to resources. But as a leader, that's something that you can also just ask your um, folks if they need assistance with that and then connect them to those resources. All right. So important regulations that you need to know. Now there's many of them. Many would argue that probably all regulations are really important, but from the nutrition side of the house, these are the ones that matter most for us. So the Department of Defense has the DOTI 1308.03, and that's our physical fitness and body composition programs. So the DOD as a whole has set the stage essentially for what the services can do with regard to their body composition programs and their physical fitness testing. Now, last year, something really big happened. Yeah? Okay. So... We had a big change to this regulation and it became a lot less prescriptive, which laid the path for the Army to be able to implement some of the things that it just implemented. Um, so we'll go through this, those in a second. But I also want to point out that the DOD also has a dietary supplement regulation as well. So if you're ever wondering, you know, OK, well, is this you know, prohibited for my soldier to be taking? You can find that information there at that regulation and then I'm gonna give you another good resource as we get going through the presentation. All right, but from the, from the actual Department of the Army, we have AR 600-9, that is our body composition program regulation. And it's gonna get a huge overhaul. I'm not sure when that new one will actually come out, but when it does, it will incorporate the newest changes that we have from last, I guess it was this year, this year, earlier this year, all right, where it provided the exemption for body fat composition testing if you have over a certain number of um, points on the ACFT, and then also changes to the way that we are going to assess body composition. So those will be all included in the newest um, version of AR 600-9, but until then we've got our two Army directives that keep that under control there. Okay, so some changes are coming, and and thankfully with that regulation change, you know, in, who knows what what can happen in the future, and maybe we can keep working to make that program work for the soldier as well. All right, so we got our military nutrition environment. All right, one thing that was a little bit sad about some of y'all's questions was that everyone seemed to assume that the defect sucks. Guess what? The DFACT doesn't if leaders go to it, because DFACTs that have leader involvement 
generally serve pretty good stuff. All right, look at this sweet picture. Okay, this is from my dining facility. First BCT over at 10th Mountain Division at Fort Drum. It's a pretty good looking plate, nice and colorful. All right, lots of good nutrients there. All right, but ultimately those dining facilities, they get money only if the soldiers go to them. So like the soldiers, they are getting BAS taken out for them to go to the dining facility, but the dining facility doesn't receive that from big army unless they go to the dining facility. So it's kind of one of those things where the soldiers might be a little bit upset. They're like, oh, that money's being taken out, but I also don't want to go to the dining facility itself. Well, then the dining facility doesn't get that money to essentially be able to buy better things and, and serve better things. So something to think about, but certainly as a leader, you should go to the DFAC. DFAC is like the best deal around town for lunch, for breakfast, even for dinner, if you wanted to go there as well, okay? It's like $4 for breakfast. And there's a whole spread, way more than you would make yourself at home. Same with lunch too, right? Who's gonna you know, cut up every little thing you need for a salad? Probably not that often, right? But you can go to the dining facility and get that whole spread for five or six bucks. So it really is such a good deal. All right. In addition to just being a good deal for you, it's also a great opportunity for you to sit and get to know your soldiers. OK, so not every we don't have to have work meetings during that time, but we can just sit and just be humans together. All right. See, you know, they're able to see you and, and what you eat and, you know, be able to kind of model some of those good behaviors that we're talking about here today. All right. Other things that are available, so not every location has this, but they are becoming more popular, are food trucks. So at Fort Drum, that's actually our food truck from Fort Drum, but it would drive around and it would be in different spots. Like you'd follow it like on Instagram and it would say, okay, we're going to be outside here for breakfast one morning. So that can make it a lot easier for your soldiers to refuel quickly after activity, especially let's say they post up in front of the barracks after PT. That means they can go ahead get their refueling in very quickly, and then go about their day. So food trucks are kind of the thing of the future. Also, of course, they've got the PX. There's other restaurants that are available on post. Um, certainly, things with food service, I think, in the military are, are due for quite a big upgrade, and I do think that that will happen in the next couple of years. So stay tuned. There may be more options available for soldiers to be able to utilize other things on post where they can utilize that BAS money for as well and not have to pay out of pocket for. And then lastly, we've got the commissary, we've got vending machines and company stores. All right, so note about the vending machines. Did you know that you can usually talk to your logistics folks or even just call the number on the vending machine and ask them if they can put different things in the vending machine? Crazy, right? All right, when I was at Fort Drum, they put a vending machine in our little like kind of battalion gym and it was a, a beverage one so it had waters it had gatorades and it had rockstar energy drink and i was like mm, i don't know if that's what we want folks to be crushing right before they come to pt so i just called the number and said hey can we just have a different flavor of gatorade no problem Next time they came, they traded it out and we didn't have Rockstar there anymore. So, you know, I'm not a, a hater against energy drinks, but do I want that to be the option when folks are coming or going from PT? Not so much, right? So we have some ability to impact that. And then there are certain vending machines now, these fit pick ones seem to be more popular amongst installations where it will have some fresher items in it, maybe more like sandwiches. Sometimes they even have like fruit cups and stuff. It kind of just depends on, on what you can get for that area. But there are some different choices there. And then lastly, company stores, all right? If you've got any say over what could be available in your company store, that could be a great, a great area to be able to influence and make sure that your folks have what they need to refuel. And it's not literally just cases upon cases upon cases of bang. All right. We need more than bang in this life. Okay. I would argue we probably don't need too much of that anyway, but we need actual food, right? Bang is not calories. Okay. It just decreases your perception of how tired you are, but it doesn't actually give you energy. All right. Let's move on here. Okay, I also want to talk a little bit about rations because you are probably familiar with many different types of rations. There's quite a few of them. I just want you all to know, those, those are specially formulated for the warfighter. 
there is so much work that goes into the creation of an MRE. All right. You know, we have the pizza MRE. I was like something that people have been waiting for for years and years and years. All right. It finally came to fruition. It's kind of a tricky thing to make shelf stable for three years. All right. So there's a lot of scientists and very smart people over at our um, research institute that specifically work on military rations. All right. So they're really cool when you kind of get into the nitty gritty of them. They are all fortified with different nutrients. I think that was a question someone had about kind of how how do you make sure that everyone's getting what they need when maybe resources are, um, you know, with food options are limited. A lot of our MRE products are fortified with things that maybe aren't naturally going to be found in the MRE because let's say, for example, omega-3 fatty acids, right? Really good source of them is like salmon, fatty fish. Well, we don't have a salmon MRE yet. Probably never going to happen. Maybe a dried salmon jerky type thing could come about, but for the most part, we're not going to have that, right? So did you know that the muffin tops are fortified with omega-3s? So there's different things being done to make sure that folks are able to get a wide variety of nutrients with those as well. If you're curious about what is in each you know, MRE pack, what are these other rations, the Human Performance Resource Center, so that website we already talked about before, has a database, Comrade, okay? So it's got all the information about the different MRE types and other field rations. So you can kind of look in and see like, okay, well, if I were to have this, this, and this, how much energy is that gonna get me? So you can kind of do some pre-planning or at least figure out, you know what, I really love, let's see, what's your favorite part of an MRE? Skittles. Okay, well, don't you want to know which, which uh, menu options have Skittles in them? Okay, so you come prepared with that information, right? Okay, there also is the brigade food advisor. So this is someone at your brigade. It's generally a warrant officer who manages any of the um, ration requests, um, maybe you're going for a training and you're getting rations, but then they also tie in with the dining facility and you are able to request different supplements. So things like, you know, orange slices, bananas, granola bars, maybe tank of Gatorade, coffee. You can request that for different unit events. All right, it comes out of your unit budget, but it is legal for you to do. So that's one person that you probably want to become friends with so that you can say, hey, we're doing this uh, fun run, and I want to make sure that we've got some snacks for people to refuel with afterwards, and you can get that stuff set up for you. Okay, and then lastly, the medical logistics team has the ability to order electrolyte beverages or oral rehydration solution. Drip drop is kind of the main one, but I'm sure there's other ones now at this point. So if you are doing some type of event in the heat and you want to make sure that you have your folks set up for success with some electrolytes, then you can get with them to make sure that you have some of that at your training event. Okay. So sometimes it's just getting to know those people that have the things that you might need and then trying to see, well, maybe what, what can we do for you? Do you want to take a ride in this cool vehicle that we have? I don't know. It's all about wheeling and dealing sometimes. All right. So when it comes to individual nutrition counseling, all right. So cool thing about nutrition is that you do not need any kind of referral from another provider to see a dietitian. It's like that at every installation at every hospital. You can literally just call the clinic and say, I'd like to make an appointment. Okay. Or you can tell your soldier to do the same thing. All right. Right now, with the Holistic Health and Fitness Resource Brigades, each of them has at least one dietitian. So most of them have two, um, a civilian and an active duty, but they all have at least one, okay? So that your soldiers or you can meet with them individually, or they can come to you, okay? That's the great thing about being in the unit is they're probably not too far from your actual area of operation. They can come walk over give a brief to, you know, your platoon or whatever, whatever they want to do. They can come meet you at the dining facility. Maybe you guys can all have lunch together. Okay. So utilizing them, getting them in your formation early is really a good way to get that working relationship. But then also when you do need something later, um, because the dietitian is really going to handle most of the nutrition education that is 
um, involved with AR 600-9. So if someone is, is flagged for body composition, they're going to have to go through that person anyway. And so you might as well get a good working relationship going so that you've got um, some good back and forth with them in relation to the regulation. And then also just making sure that your folks are good to go. I mean, it's we, we don't want to do that sort of reactionary care of getting to someone after something's already happened, right? So if we can get out and, you know, get to know your soldiers, work with them on things proactively, then everyone really wins in that situation. And we're, you know, we're optimizing performance the way that we should. All right, you also will have probably a dietitian at the clinic or the hospital on your installation as well. So, you know, if your soldier's got something maybe more medical going on, then they potentially could be seeing that person as well. And then lastly, we've got a bunch of telehealth options now if there is not a dietitian at your particular installation. But I can't think of any installation where there's no dietitian. Um, we got, got pretty well covered between the active duty and civilians that are employed with the Army. And then perhaps you might need an outside referral. That's something that can be happen at the, that can um, go through the MTF and then we can get you whatever care you need outside if it's something more specialized, okay? But these are the options, all right? Again, meeting individually or one-on-one -on -one, or maybe meeting in a group setting to kind of work on just performance, nutrition overall with your platoon or your unit as a whole. Um, we are always happy to get away from our offices and, and go out where, where you guys are. All right, dietary supplements. A lot of questions about dietary supplements here. Okay, so I call it the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm gonna start with the good. Don't worry too much about this. Again, I'm gonna give you the slides that you have it. All right, there's very few supplements that have really good research that support that they do good things to performance. Okay, they're right here. It's not that exciting of a list, it's pretty small. All right. Now note that these are the individual ingredients. All right. Dietary supplements are a little bit tricky because many times you're getting a supplement that has multiple ingredients. And oftentimes it can be difficult to tell how much of whatever that ingredient is present within that supplement. OK, you'll see um, things listed under proprietary blend. And so you're not going to get the actual amount of the individual ingredient, but you may get a, the amount of like a whole group of ingredients. OK, when it comes to taking a supplement and wanting to improve your performance, dosage matters. OK, so if you're paying for something that says it has creatine in it, but it only has one gram of creatine, that's not going to be that helpful for you. Right. We need a dosage that actually makes sense and that we have some research to support. So something to think about with supplements. All right. With those, just in general, there's ways that you can look for supplements that are going to be a better option for you. And I'm going to go through that in just a second. All right. But let's move on here real quick to the bad and the ugly. All right. The bad are the ones that have just really unsupported claims. So no research really shows that it does anything. And unfortunately, you can pretty much put a supplement out there. And as long as you say it doesn't cure a disease, it is um, likely going to be able to go on the market. They don't have to show that it is effective at what they're saying it does. All right, so that's the bad stuff. It just doesn't really do anything or it doesn't contain what's needed to actually cause a physiological response. And then the ugly stuff is the stuff that actually can mess with our health long term. And so I'm not here to talk about the efficacy of these things. So do they work? The problem is that there's too many other issues associated with their use and also not to mention that many of them are prohibited for use by the DOD. So the stuff specifically in the, with the asterisks are um, prohibited by the DOD. So a lot of different options with supplements out there, but we just have to be thoughtful about the kinds that we choose. Now, Operation Supplement Safety is a really wonderful website. That's also a DOD website, but it's got some great information. You can look up individual ingredients. You can look up if something's on the prohibited list and you can make sure that your supplement is at least, you know, a better choice than others. So the first thing that you want to look for on your supplement is going to be a third party certification seal. All right. So this seal just shows that another company that's not the company that made that supplement has gone in, looked inside, tested what's inside that product and 
verifies that whatever is on the ingredients list is what's in that product in the amount that they're advertising it as as well. Okay, that's all that means. Fortunately, it doesn't mean does this supplement work? Um, we don't have a lot of great testing on that um, with specific supplements other than those ingredients that I just showed you there. Okay, but you want to look for these things on your supplement. Now, NSF specifically is the one that's recognized by the NCAA. So if you are on one of our teams here, D1 teams, then that's the kind that you want to make sure that you've got that seal on them. Now, there's a really cool checklist that's available at that Operation Supplement Safety website as well. And I would recommend that, especially once you get into a leadership position, make sure that you have a copy of this and your NCOs have a copy of this. Because guess who goes and does barracks inspections? Could be you, probably your NCO, right? So at least arm them with something where when they come over to that, uh, to a certain soldier's barracks and they got like 16 different tubs and bottles of stuff that maybe we can take the moment and kind of go through this and actually see if these products are, are going to be helpful for you. And if there's any that are dangerous or prohibited, let's get those out of there. Okay, so you can just see the, the first question, of course, is does that product have a third party certification seal on it? And then there's just some other kind of common sense things like, you know, does it have less than six ingredients? Does it have a proprietary blend, matrix or complex, which again is kind of how some manufacturers can kind of hide what amount there might be of something. I would say that most times when we do the investigation and figure out what's in something, there's not that much of whatever active, you know, products they think is going to be in there. It's kind of just a mix of a bunch of different ingredients. And it oftentimes doesn't contain the amount that's really needed for physiological response. So just something to keep in mind. That's why if you're going to choose a supplement, you know, think about getting one that doesn't have a bunch of other ingredients in it as well. All right. Also thinking about, can you easily pronounce the name? If you've got a supplement and you're looking at it and it's like 1-3 dihydroxy, blah, 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 this whole thing, that's usually a sign. Turn away, put it down, okay? It's not gonna be a good one for you, okay? We wanna be able to know what the ingredients are. And then caffeine, that's another kind of crucial one. All right, 200 milligrams or less, that's the dosage that is really recommended um, for performance enhancement any more than that and you can get into kind of having some of those adverse side effects like you know increased anxiety heart rate increasing that are less pleasant okay and with the d or with the army in general they recommend not exceeding 600 milligrams of caffeine so that's two bangs a day all right so no need to have two bangs a day we can do that other ways we can get our caffeine other ways all right and then is it free of quick quick fix claims I would say the more intense and like muscular person is on the label, sometimes that's a good sign that like, oh, okay, this is gonna be interesting. Um, oftentimes the kind of boring stuff, like the first slide that I showed you, it doesn't have that fancy of like graphics on it. It's like, this is creatine. Okay, it doesn't have a huge muscular guy on it. All right, and then last couple things you can see there. So ultimately, you add up this scorecard, and then you get a um, you know kind of total where you can say, okay, you know what, this one's probably a no go, or this one's probably okay. All right. Now, again, with this, we're not able to really say that this supplement is safe. All right. So that's kind of a, a separate thing. If you do have some type of adverse reaction to a supplement, even if you're not sure, because maybe you're taking like multiple supplements, you can report that on this website as well. And it goes to the FDA, which is the governing body that ultimately has to wait until people complain that a product has done things to them before they can go in and actually investigate and potentially take it off the market. So stuff's kind of slow to change in, the, in that regard, but reporting it is kind of the first step. So please report those things. All right, some final thoughts for you here as we close. All right, first one is, you know, just having that presence, eat with your soldiers, okay? Maybe you don't always go to the dining facility, but certainly eating with them, getting that good deal for lunch is always a good option. All right, also take breaks for lunch, all right? Just about every unit I've been in schedules some very long meeting at noon. Why? Why do we do that to ourselves? If we can avoid it, or at least make it a working lunch, right? Where you can bring your lunch to it, okay? Let's take breaks for lunch. 
That way our soldiers see that we're doing that and they don't feel like they are obligated to work through lunch as well. Okay, so let's make that okay. Unless mission absolutely dictates that we can't do that, we should be able to have those breaks for meals. All right, and then model that, model that positive professional behavior, but soldiers do have their own autonomy. All right, many of y'all's questions were, how do I make my soldiers eat healthy when they don't want to? You can't, okay? You're just one person, all right? You can model those behaviors, all right? And oftentimes being able to see what someone's doing makes it more enticing for someone else, but we can't force them to do anything, okay? We can obviously talk to them about the performance benefits, especially if their performance is lacking, that you know what? this might be something that you want to try, or I'm going to make sure to hook you up with this resource because it looks like this is something that we're struggling in. Okay. But we really can't force anybody to do anything. All right. And then we got to think about dignity and respect, core values of the army here, but we've got to be careful about our language. All right. I think especially within the body composition space, I've heard a lot of very disparaging remarks made about soldiers related to body composition and, you know, just, Poor, poor taste, all right? We are all humans, we deserve dignity and respect, and there's no reason for us to speak about our soldiers like that, because if you do that, they likely get that you don't care for them, okay? And that really erodes trust. So let's make sure we're treating everyone with respect, getting them the resources that they need, and not making any kind of comments about their body, and also food shaming them. You know, the number of soldiers that I've talked to who are like, well, I don't eat lunch anymore at work because too many people made comments about them like eating an apple or something. It's like, you just can't win, okay? So please, you know, foster an environment where there's not comments about that. We're happy when people eat, they get to make the decisions that they make about food, and that's something that is their choice, all right? When we talk about bodies or performance, it really is helpful to think about it in terms of the performance itself. So what is the thing that needs to get done and not about what do you look like doing it? Because I'd say that's one very big thing for the Army is like, you know, we have specific abilities that need to be met for particular jobs. You can look a lot of different ways to be able to get that done. So try to think about performance language versus you need to be a certain size to be able to do X, Y, Z. All right. And then, of course, please discourage any kind of fasting or fad dieting amongst your soldiers. That's a really quick way to erode um, readiness in your unit if everyone's jumping on some interesting bandwagon that involves them in reaching a low energy availability um, scenario. So we want to avoid that. And then within the regulation, and I'm sure when we have the updated AR 600-9, it will include this as well, but there is some ability to determine when you have the fitness testing and the body composition testing. So let's use some common sense about that. We don't need to make them super close together. We maybe can, can work within our schedule to make that um, helpful for everybody. And then finally, engage those resources early. So if you've got an H2F team, when you get on the ground at your first unit, go meet with them. I mean, if nothing else, you can get information from them for yourself, but then think about, okay, well, you know what, I'm going to have the dietitian come over because I've noticed that this is going on in my, in, within my folks and I want to make sure that I address that. All right. Also behavioral health, another resource that, you know, we want to engage early and not wait until someone is having a crisis to get them involved. And then any other kind of medical stuff that might be needed. The earlier we can get things involved when we're really coming at it from a more proactive approach, the better things are overall for our soldiers. All right. So that's all I have. I can take some of your questions now. And lastly on here, I do have some additional resources for you, just some websites, but then also some folks to follow on social media that generally give out some pretty good information. Is everyone awake still? Yes. You're asking, like, what would I do as the treatment, or what should you do as the leader? 
Okay, well, as the leader, get them to the resource that's needed. Um, certainly when you talk to them. Can you repeat the question, ma'am? Oh, thank you. I forgot to do that. Okay, so she's just wondering, you know, if someone is experiencing REDS, what should you as the leader do, but then also what would I do as a dietitian to kind of mitigate that situation? So firstly, um, as the leader, you know, certainly when you are speaking to them, I would definitely come at it from the angle of performance, all right? Like, hey, performance seems to be suffering. What do we think is going on? I want you to see the dietitian because I think they are going to be able to help you make sure that we're meeting your needs. So refer. You're not their dietitian. You don't have to be, right? You can send them to the experts. And then um, on the dietitian side, when we meet with them, we will kind of explore a couple different things, but ultimately just making sure that, you know, what, what is the reason for why we're not meeting our needs? Is this a time thing, a knowledge thing? Are we purposely doing this? And then that kind of helps us figure out how we address it. And then back to kind of the leadership standpoint, if you've got someone who is not meeting their needs on a on a very prolonged basis, then there are things that you can do in coordination with the medical team to either kind of decrease the physical stuff that they're doing to make it easier for them to be able to meet their needs um, just for a temporary time. Um, and then we can work them back up to full abilities again. Anything else? Okay. All right. You had a question back there? Can you go back to the slide that shows the supplements that we'll stay away from? Yes. You're going to get these slides too, though. So, all right. Other questions? Yes. As a platoon leader, are we ever going to have direct contact with Dr. B, an advisor, or all of our requests to be sent through the chain? They probably will go through the chain, but there is nothing stopping you from like introducing you to that person. You know, you probably see them in passing different events that your unit might have. So you could, I mean, I don't think any of them would turn down like, I'm not going to meet with you. Like no one comes looking for them anyway most of the time. So they'd be like, oh, this lieutenant wants to talk to me. Cool. Set up a meeting. How can I help them? Yes. How will, how will we deal with soldiers that? All right, so how do you deal with soldiers that are using the ugly supplements? All right, so the thing with, overall you could come at it from like, it is illegal for them to use some of these things. All right, if you are provided testosterone by your actual medical doctor, that's different, okay? But if you're finding like paraphernalia for some of these things, within their area, like that is something where you can specially request that they are drug tested and they are drug tested for those things. So, I mean, that's one way to do it. And then that's a UCMJ situation. But I mean, certainly with any of the other things, just, you know, educating them on the fact that like, this is just not a great long-term plan. And there is a lot of um, side effects and other long-term complications that I think as like an 18 year old, you're probably not caring that much if you can have kids later in life but you might care about that at some point. So just trying to kind of help them out with that. But if anything falls within like the prohibited list or it is not something that a soldier is supposed to be engaging in, then you can certainly use that side of things too. Yeah. Other questions? Instructors, did you have any questions or comments to highlight? for being here with us today. I know hopefully you got something out of that. I know personally as a company grade leader, um, something that I didn't think about when I was training as I fight was what can I do in terms of snacks? Like how do I provide my soldiers with opportunities to train that aspect? When we're leaders, we are resourcing and training our soldiers. And part of that resource is what kind of snacks are they going to exit the AA with? Or what are they going to train with? If they're having that for the first time when we are in the fight and it doesn't agree with them or it doesn't assist in their performance, that's the wrong time to figure that out, right? Um, so we want to make sure that we are knowledgeable on that and we know who to go to. Um, so 
Appreciate you being here today. Appreciate all of you being here today. Uh, again, this slideshow will go out in a link on the YouTube channel. It'll also go out on Canvas along with all the regulations that you saw cited uh, and all the resources and social media accounts. So you will have all that information armed. Uh, and particularly if you haven't done this already into your safe or later folder that you can pull out when you're a platoon leader. And oh, I remember we had a lecture on this in PE 450. I can pull that out, look at the DODI, look at the policy, look at OPSS.org, and get that list of no no things that your soldiers aren't supposed to be taking, if you're not supposed to be taking, because it will change. The landscape will change over time. Um, without further ado, that is all we have. You are dismissed to head out to your next class. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to come up and talk with Major Fowles or Martin. Thank <laughs> you.